<laughs> it's interesting because um, just, just a few moments ago, considering uh, being in this room and feeling so much gratitude to the Lord for what he's done, what he's doing for you, for, for his activity, and just seeing dreams come true uh, from you know, becoming, becoming a bit more racially diverse to seeing children and students get baptized and going, there, there's another generation following us that loves Jesus, hallelujah. You know, because sometimes you can just look around and you say, it's hopeless. Nobody loves Jesus anymore. And the church is dying. And then I come and I worship with you. And no, it's not. Jesus is alive. He's at work in his people. And so I'm just so grateful for you and those of you serving. Man, just and sensing the presence of Jesus in this room, it just makes it worthwhile, doesn't it? It's so good to be together with all of you. Last weekend, a lot of you had trouble getting here. We went on with 11 o'clock, and uh, <clears throat> my good friend and brother Aaron Layton was with us. And Shane, I don't know if you can zoom in on this book. I'd love you to try to do that. But Aaron was with us, and was such a blessing. And, and I'd love for you to read this book, maybe sit down with someone that's from a different race or color, a culture, and just discuss it. He, because here's the deal. As, as people of the Lord, we need to admit in humility that we don't have all the answers. That's the first step. Just saying, I have blind spots. Would any of you agree this morning that you have blind spots? Would you be, yeah. So. The, that's humility, it's saying, I don't have all the answers, I don't know everything, and so to sit down with someone who's had a different background and say, just help me understand, tell me about your life and your experience, so important. Uh, we want to be known and we want to be needed. And you have that feeling, or there are people around you that have that feeling as well, love for you to pick this up in the bookstore and, and maybe uh, tune in to last week and just see what we talked about, had a great dialogue with him, just trying to move us forward in under, understanding one another. Because I'll admit, I, I, I don't know everything. You don't, Pastor John? No, I don't. I don't know everything. So I need to learn, need to have that posture of learning. All my life, I want to be learning. Well, we're in this series that we're beginning today, and it's called The Four Commandments of Marriage. The Four Commandments of Marriage. And when we when we, when we think about marriage, we need to say, okay, uh, what, is it, what is it? What is it supposed to look like versus what it, what it really does look like? A couple of years ago, somebody gave us a, a timeshare in Mexico and uh, seeing all the pictures of beaches and the palm trees, they said, yay, here we go. It was like in the middle of the winter, kind of like where we are now with ice and snow. So then we started getting ready to go and <clears throat> all those questions start occurring to you, like, was well, the passport updated? Oh, and that, yeah, now somebody's got to watch Odie. And we got to take the dog to the sitter. And then oh, we gotta, I got to leave my coffee maker. And they don't always make coffee like I make it. And I got to leave my bed. I, I, and then there's just the hassle of going through customs and all that, that at some point you almost feel like it's just too much trouble. But when you're going for sunshine, it's just not too much trouble. You just kind of get over it. You can't go to Mexico without leaving the USA. That's kind of the point. And you, 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 you get there, and when you get there, you see the signs that says, we don't accept US currency, or we don't take credit cards. You go, oh man, this is a hassle, but it's worth it. And there's a problem that some marriages aren't flourishing because they aren't following the design plan the way God intended, and that's why it's not working for you or for me or for us. And we're trying to use a different currency in marriage than we, than we should. We're trying to use the currency of, of being a young adult or being a teenager, and it just doesn't work anymore. So why this series? Because I know that some of you are saying, this doesn't apply to me. So pastor, why are you doing this? If 40% of our church are, are single, and I realize that and I recognize that. I, I was where you are for most of my adult life, so was my wife. But no apologies this morning for this message, because when, we, when one person suffers, we all suffer. When one person is going through things in their marriage, it affects you, it affects me, when other people around me are going. So we're, we're not just here for ourselves, amen? 
We're here for Jesus and we're here for each other and because we want to be instrumental in loving one another and helping and strengthening one another in marriage. Whether we're married or not, you might be divorced, you might be widowed, but I bet most of you who are older adults, you have some young person in your life that you can influence and say, let me tell you about God's way, because God's way is the best way. So I'm, I'm convinced that none of you are going to check out and say, oh, this ain't for me, oh, come on. No, I'm convinced of better things of you that whether you've been married 40 years or four years or you've never been married or you were married or you're widowed or you're divorced, whatever your case may be, that you would say, we need to know what God has to say about this. Where else are we gonna turn? We're gonna look at Hollywood? Yeah, that's really working out great, isn't it? Their ideas about marriage uh, or, or in the movies, which, which basically says about three things. It, you need to find your soulmate, and if you aren't with your soulmate, you need to get, dump the one you're with and find your soulmate. Or if you have a great time in bed, then that fixes everything, and that's not true. Or that you should look for the person that can make you happy, that that's the goal in life. And none of that is really scriptural. There are pieces of it that are true, but it's, there's a mixture, as in all of the enemy's ways of trying to get us off track. There's an L, a seed of truth, but then a whole lot of other stuff that's just simply not true. So, so we want to say, well, what does God have to say about marriage? We're going to look at the first, what I will say, the first commandment regarding marriage. Genesis 2 and 24, and this is a little different series, different message. We're not going to take a long passage of Scripture and explain it kind of expository style like we usually do. It's kind of a topical series, but I really feel like we need to talk about this. Genesis 2 and 24 says what? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Now, the first commandment regarding marriage is, we've said it in different ways, leave and cleave, let go, hold on, or as my grandma used to say about a smothering parent that she knew, she said, she needs to cut those apron strings. And I knew what she meant. She's saying this, somebody needs to leave and somebody needs to cleave. And there's a resistance in me and in almost every man, if we'll be honest, there's a resistance to oneness in marriage. Uh, there's a, a tendency in myself to go to my cave and figure things out when I'm in a funk. And I used to do that especially, uh, just, I had a tendency as a teenager to get melancholy, kind of get in a funk, kind of pout, and that, tra- that kind of followed me into marriage. Well, there's this thing that happens in marriage. You wake up and you go, she's there, she's everywhere. <laughs> I'm going, I, I go to the basement to try to get away from her and she's following me and like on my shoulder, what are you doing? What's wrong? What are you thinking? And what felt like nagging to me was actually a gift from God, the goodness of God to pull me out of isolation. I was learning to cleave and not just leave. And so this is, this is, this is something that, that God is asking me to do and asking men to do, and it's not, so we said, well, why does he say, therefore a man shall leave? What about the mom? What about the lady? It's because of this. Here's what I believe is that the man should lead. The man should show the first, be the first one and say, this is how you do it, babe. So, so because that men can often acquiesce back into, well, you know, I don't know, and then this passive kind of way about us rather than saying, all right, I'm going to leave. I'm going to lead by example. And, and here's why this is so important. I, I was reading yesterday, just happened to be reading and in one of those advice columns, and here, here's an actual letter that was sent in. Dear Abby, or whatever it was, it says, I have been dating this woman for six months now. I recently asked her to marry me. She said, yes, we've been telling her family and friends about it and are making the wedding plans. She's 24 and I'm 20. I'm still living at home with my mother. That's not bad. He's young. But here's the part, he says, and I've yet to tell my mom the news because 
I am sure she will be very upset and angry. We need this message. Or maybe there's a girl that's, that's married and you're here and you're listening, and, but you have to call your mom every day because if you don't, she's going to give you the silent treatment. That will be a problem in marriage. Or a guy gets married, but he's emotionally distant from his wife. He's just disconnected. He's like connected to everything else. When he comes home, he gives her the leftovers from the job and leftovers from happy hour. Or a guy that seems devoted to his wife, he can't make any decisions without getting his dad's approval. And then when he doesn't get his dad's approval, his dad pouts and he pouts. Problem. This is why we need this marriage. A marriage will not be what it could be. You can survive, but you will not thrive until you get this part right, until I get this part right. So God, God in chapter 2 of Genesis, the setting here is that, that God has created everything. And in Ch Genesis 2, uh, Moses rewinds and summarizes and says, okay, here's the way creation happened. God formed the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the way he did it, he formed them from the ground. So the, the, the word says, Moses says, that God actually spoke to the ground. When he made man, he formed him from the dust. It's a word in Hebrew that may, means like to form as a potter would with a piece of clay on his potter's wheel, that that's the way God shaped Adam. And he created all these animals and he said, after five days, at the end of every day, he said what? This is good. And the first time he says it's not good is when he made man, because he says it's not good for what? You know this part, him to be alone. So God does this interesting little illustrated sermon where he brings the animals by Adam and says, what do you think you should call him? And Adam goes, that's a, that's a gorilla, that's a giraffe. You know, it, of course, it was in his own way, and I don't know what the language was then. He's naming all these animals, and it says, but he couldn't find a helper for himself. In other words, he couldn't find somebody that fit to him. He, says, he, he looked at the gorilla and says, oh, well, okay, yeah, he's, he's got enough. I see some resemblance there. He's a little more hairy than I am, but uh, he's not much good for conversation. And then he, then uh, the dogs, oh, well, that's a great friend to have, but he's not much help around the house. And then there's a the lion, he's a really warm and fuzzy at night, but then he's got that biting thing. And oh, by the way, he is a cat. <laughs> so he can't find, <laughs> he can't find a helper, so God, it says in, Genesis chapter 2, verse 22, that he takes something from the man's side. Some translations say rib. It's actually a Hebrew word that can mean plank, chamber, beam. It's God took something from Adam, closed it up, and then uses a different word here. And the English standard verse simply says made, but it's actually a Hebrew word that means built. She's a brick house. So, but this part, built, isn't like we think about it. I'm making fun here, but just trying to get you to travel along with me. That God fashioned her in a different way than he made Adam. And, and what, what Moses is trying to show us is the distinction. The distinction in the way he he shaped Eve from something that was in Adam. So something was taken from the man, and it was shaped into this woman. And it says, the Bible says that God presented her, brought her to the man. Is it, well, what do you think about this? Instead of the gorilla, the lion, or the giraffe. And he breaks into song. It's literally a poem. If you'll notice in your translations, it will show this kind of in quotes. So he breaks into this poem, this song, says, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The Moses sees the distinction, and then Moses says, as he's recapturing, recounting all this, he says, Therefore, because of these things, 
Verse 24, therefore, because of this, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold to, cling to his wife. So two things we're going to look at quickly. Leave. What do you leave? This command is quoted by Jesus in two different gospels. We hear it. It's quoted by Paul on two separate occasions. So this is five times in the Bible. You see something once, pay attention to it. See it two or three times in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let every word be established. The Bible says that. But this here is five times, so it's a big deal. A man shall leave. And it's interesting because Adam had no parents to leave. You ever think about that? He didn't have anybody to leave. So why is this being said? It's being said so it will be passed down to the next generation so that Adam could say when he's, he's telling the story to his son, he said, see this in my side, maybe he still had a scar. He said, let me tell you about your mom. And by the way, therefore, son, some point you're gonna exit out of this house. You're going to leave whether you want to or not. <laughs> You're going to leave because mom is number one in my life. Well, God is, but then there's mom, and then there's you, and then the grandkids. Sometimes it would be the grandkids more than you. <laughs> a man shall leave. So this is the proper way. That, this is the way God says this is, you're going to flourish if you do this. Dan Allender, one of the more respected Christian psychologists in America, also an author and professor, says this. I think it's interesting. He says this, the failure to shift loyalty from parents to spouse is a central issue in almost all marital conflict. At somewhere, somewhere you can almost point back to the root of the problem being a, a, a misplaced loyalty rather than being loyal to your wife and that being the number one personal relationship in your life, you have all these other relationships that are secondary, that are first, and, and you make your marriage secondary. So let go, hold on, cut the apron strings. So that means, first of all, leaving physically. A man shall leave the comfort and care of mom and dad. Sometimes this happens all at once. Sometimes you get married and you leave on the same day. Sometimes there's a gap where you go to college and you come back for a while. And sometimes you're in with mom and dad while you're getting your house built and you're trying. There's, I'm, not, I'm not saying that all of that, is, I'm, I'm acknowledging that sometimes it's varied and there are nuances of it, but there should always be this sense when you come back home, this is only temporary. You need to get out of the house. You need to leave. You may have to move back for a while, but you need to understand and that there needs to be clear boundaries. This is only temporary. Some days it would be nice to be a child again, amen? When my greatest decision in life was simply to understand mom is gonna be baloney today or PBJ. Which one is it gonna be? Am I gonna play t-ball or am I gonna play basketball? Those are my biggest decisions in life, Ang anguish over them. Now it's so much bigger and sometimes I just, yeah, I like to be back home and not have to worry about things. But leaving physically is usually the easiest part. The harder parts are those other strings that stay attached after you leave home. When kids move physically but not emotionally. And I believe it's just as important to break the emotional intimacy from your parents. Not forsake the love and affection of your parents. Not forsake your parents, that's not what I'm saying. Yes, honor your parents. Yes to affection. Yes to love and care. But there should be a door in your heart that says, reserve for my spouse. Mom doesn't go in there, dad doesn't, grandma, nobody else goes in there but spouse. And there are some who are more transparent with their parent than they are with their spouse. They're more vulnerable with their parent than they are with their spouse. They tell more to their mom about their feelings than they do their wife. Or she's always been my daddy's girl and she's still daddy's girl, uh-uh. 
She's not. You might, there's a special relationship with a dad and a girl, but the, the number one dude in your life should not be your dad. I know this is tough, guys, but if we're gonna grow, we need to say, what is God saying? A man shall leave his father and mother, leave emotionally. Leave the parental counselor sessions behind. Yes, ask for advice. But one of the best things a parent can do is when the, when the child begins to dump their marriage stuff, their laundry, their marriage trash, talk negative about their spouse, well, he don't do this, and I didn't know it was gonna be, and he won't, and, and, and all that, that the parent should say something like, yeah, but have you guys talked about this? Have you prayed? I, I know you're talking to me, but have you talked to him? Have you talked to her? Well, no, I haven't yet. It was, you need to do that. And I tell you what, I'm confident you guys are gonna make a wise decision. Now, how about the Cardinals? <laughs> I think this long-term, seeing myself as the long-term counsel of, of my child is a dangerous place to be. And it doesn't help the child get loose. Uh, some of you are arguing right now. You're saying you don't understand my, my kids and I, we have a unique relationship, or I have a unique re relationship with my parents. I think I do understand. I have some of the wisest parents in the world. My in-laws are some of the sweetest, deeply devoted Christians in the world. But there is a place, a boundary, a door that does not open to parents anymore. It's only open to my spouse. Yeah, there are exceptions. There's always exceptions. You know, when, when you're physically endangered or you are being abused and you have to get, you have to call dad. I understand that. But we're talking about letting go of those emotional strings at some point that you are letting them go. That's, and, and it's amazing when we finally get out the door you know, while you're still at home, you get frustrated with your parents, yeah? You say, oh, I just get out of them. I just can't stand them. They're just in my life all the time. You get out and you go, my parents are so smart. <laughs> now I get it. You, is it I, I mean, you know that's true. Your parents got so smart after you left home. Yeah, it's like, they didn't get any smarter. You got smarter. You go, man, now I understand. Now I get it. But when you're there, you just can't stand them. And, and it's because God has put in us this need to be independent. It's a God-given thing. A man shall leave his father and mother and, and cling to his wife. Should, they should cut the financial cord. Yeah, there are gonna be times when you help your kids out and you're gonna reach back to be helped by your parents. I understand that, but it should always be no strings attached. It should just be a gift. Here, we just wanna sow into your marriage. No strings attached, we don't want it back. But as long as there's strings attached, then there's gonna be problems. You're gonna be waiting for that dollar to come back home. Well, has he got a job yet? Because I'm waiting, see, and it, and it just be, the best thing we can do, I heard about this grandma just yesterday, she said, I, I, I took my 13 year old to the bank, opened his checking account. I gave him his first deposit and I said, now, grandson, grandbaby, let me tell you, honey, what's gonna happen is you're gonna make some money, you're gonna put it into this account so that when you're 16 and you can drive, you're gonna have a car. Isn't that awesome? And I'm gonna be cheering you on, and here's a little deposit put on to get this going. That's awesome. See, that's a way of, of helping them learn responsibility. Well, not only physical, of course, but also sexually, that like glue, this word means to cling, cling to them physically, so we're going to leave physically, we're going to cleave physically, and we don't need to go into great detail about this because I've talked about it before, but things like hugging and making love actually create oxytocin, which is a hormone that nurtures the bond between husband and wife. So guys who say, well, I'm just not affectionate, I don't, you know, I'm just not the hugging type, get over it. 
So as I've, I, I'll just tell you, as I've done before, here's what you do. You take these arms and you put them around your wife like this or like this, not like this. You put your arms around your wife. I know I'm being silly, but I'm trying to be, help us. And you hold and you don't let go till she does. That's what you do. You don't do the guy slap on the back. You know, you, you hold and you release when she does. Then you release. Physically cleave. Not just physically cleave, but emotionally cleave. So guys, I know, we're, we're saying, well, I'm just, I'm not, I don't know how to talk about my feelings, I'm not emotional. Yes, you are emotional, you're just not in touch with it yet. So sometimes we can talk to our friends about our marriage, we can talk to our parents, and we never talk to each other about our feelings. If you want to see your wife warm up to you guys, talk about it. Talk about your feelings. Say, I'm afraid when you're afraid. Amen. Say, I'm anxious when you're anxious. Say, I'm happy when you're happy. Don't have her reading your mind all the time. And you talk about building trust and cementing the marriage when you're able to. I've talked to so many women who will say, I just feel like I don't know his heart. I've, I've, I can't remember the last time a wife has said, you know what, he just talks about his feelings too much. <laughs> I can't remember that. Maybe it's happened, but it's usually not the case. And, and it's the opposite sometimes with the women, sometimes, not in all cases, but a girl will talk to her girlfriends about the intimate deals, uh, deal of her marriage and not talk to him about it. Talk about it. Now, some of you are saying, well, you don't know my husband, you don't know my wife, they don't care. Maybe, but have you invested the time? Have you invested the, the conversation in talking to them about it? Hold on, cleave, why is this such a big deal? It's not just a big deal for the marriage, my friends, it's a big deal for God and the gospel. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, the Apostle Paul says, as the scriptures say, and here's where he quotes Moses, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. So marriage points to an eternal reality a spiritual reality, this is why we must get it right, because just in the same way we are to leave other gods, we are to leave our selfishness and cleave to the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, whether or not you're married, ever will be, or you were, and it was awful, uh, what, you are not a half person waiting to be whole. I used to hear that as a single person. Well, you know, when you get really whole, then God's gonna bring you your other half. So no, that's not true. If you are in Christ, you are complete in him. That's Bible. You're not a second-class citizen. You're not a second-class church member. You are just as much a brother and sister in Christ and a child of God as anyone else. Marriage is temporary, always. It's only an earthly existence. In heaven, we won't be married. Some of you are like, yay, some of you are sad. <laughs> we won't have need of sex. We won't have that loneliness. We won't ever feel that again. So it's gonna be a different existence. And we can find contentment and wholeness in Christ while we're living in this broken world and while we're trying to unite with each other and, it, and, it's, and it's hard sometimes and we wanna escape and so on. Grace gives us the power to do it. So grace will help us as we leave father and mother to cleave to our spouse. Moses says, here's how you will flourish. And then he says in, in Genesis chapter 30, he's telling the people of Israel as he's getting ready to die, he says, I set before you life and death. 
And here's what life is. It is to cling to God, it uses the same word, cling to God, leave your idols behind, leave and cleave to God. Here's how you will flourish. You will have death on one side and curses on one side if you reject God, but if you cling to God, you will have blessings. and Your life will not be under a curse. But here's the reality, we can't do it perfectly, can we? And we can't do it perfectly in marriage. So it's broken and sometimes we do it right, but a lot of times we do it wrong. And sometimes we have tethers to our children that are unhealthy and it's hard to let go. It's hard to let go. So, so God says, I know you won't do this perfectly. I know you'll sometimes lean back into your selfishness, lean back into your little idols. And, and so here's what I will do. I will leave my father, Jesus says. I will leave my father and I will assume the curse so that you can be blessed. So the symbol that is above me today I stand under the cross and we stand under the cross and we receive the blessing of God although we don't always leave and cleave to God as we should. And the curse has fallen upon Jesus so that the blessing of my Father can fall upon me. But it's still the reality, my friends, that we must leave our idols and we must cleave to God. So this is all a picture of the gospel. This is why we must get it right. Leave your father and mother, cleave to your wife. This is a symbol of what God does for you, what he has done for you in Christ. And because he's done that for you, he enables you to do what seems like it's so difficult. Let go and cling. Like those trapeze artists that I've seen from time to time, there's that moment where they have to let go and they fly through the air, and the other person's job is to catch them. And this is what we do in faith. We let go, and we reach out, and God always catches us. He will catch you today. You let go of your your little idols and say, yeah, but what, and how can I live sexually pure, and how can I let go? Hold to God's unchanging hand. He will not let you down. He will be enough. He will be enough for you. Let go of your alcoholism. Let go of your drugs. Let go of your selfishness. Let go and cling to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is enough. So I don't want to end without acknowledging the pain in the room. I've tried to. But I know that some of you are here, you go, oh man, I want this so much. My husband doesn't love Jesus, or my wife, she doesn't doesn't want this. What am I supposed to do? I know you're here, and I want to tell you, you're not alone. You're not alone. As a single person, you're not alone. That's why we emphasize so much Sunday night life, having people around you that can pray with you, support you. One of our deacons, Tony Martino, has a wonderful group. I think it's full, but... But she has, a, and there were a couple other others. I know Ruth Carlton has a group to a lot of women without spouses that love Jesus or they've already gone to be with Jesus. It's so good to be together and say, we've got each other's back. That you're not alone. Small groups are a piece of it. It's not all the answer, but it's part of it. Secondly, we believe in miracles. We do. How can I get through this? Hold on, my friend. Hold on, my sister. I've seen God restore and bring men to repentance, bring them to their knees and say, I've been a jerk, forgive me. I've seen that happen. And I've seen vice versa. I've seen how God can heal the marriage. We believe in miracles. The answer isn't, oops, I married the wrong one. That's not the answer. The answer is always Jesus. Jesus at the center of it all. Can I pray with you and for us? God, 
we are selfish creatures without you. And we would sometimes be happy to be alone in our caves and to try to escape the oneness that you call us to in marriage. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us for our isolation as the people of the Lord where we pull away from each other because it's just too painful. And you say that we are one in Jesus Christ. Lord, I, I pray for those who are struggling today to let go of their children. And I pray, God, that you will take anything I've said that may be misunderstood. Would you let the chaff fall away? Let the good seed fall on good ground. Lord, because we know you call us to honor our parents, and that's a lifetime thing. Uh, You call us to, to love one another and to leave the, the other relationships behind that would cloud the marriage and to be united as one. You make us one. Make us one as a church. Make us one with Christ. Lord, those who don't know Jesus today, that they would know that it's impossible to have a marriage that flourishes without Jesus at the center. And that we can't find who we really are without being united to you. And we thank you, oh our God, that you have put on Jesus the curse of our sin so that the blessing of God could be ours. The blessing of God could reign upon us as your sons and daughters, fallen but secure in Christ, Lord, we thank you and we praise you. God, we pray for those who are in pain today and suffering, who are neglected in their marriage and who long for more. Give them hope today, Lord. May they be encouraged and strengthened by the body of Christ and by the word of God in Jesus' name.